This is the Discovery Files from the U.S. National Science Foundation. Mushrooms are having a popular culture moment unlike anything since the Super Mario Brothers in the 1980s. Another video game, The Last of Us, and its television adaptation have created a lot of interest in the parasitic fungus cordyceps. To learn more, we're joined today by Charissa De Becker, Assistant Professor of Biology at Utrecht University, who has published several papers on cordyceps and zombie ants. Dr. De Becker, thank you for joining us today. Starting with the most basic point, what is cordyceps? So cordyceps or Ophiocordyceps uh, is a genus of fungi that can infect insects. And some of those fungi can, uh, in addition to infecting them and killing them, manipulate their behavior such that um, the insect behaves in such a way that it's helping the fungus to better spread its spores. Where around the world is cordyceps found? Uh, you can find cordyceps and Ophiocordyceps everywhere around the world, basically. So every continent... Uh, has these fungi or fungi have to been described from every single continent and um, um, infecting different different insects. So for Ophiocordyceps, for instance, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis group, which are the fungi that I work on, they specifically infect ants. Unfortunately, we do not find them in, in Europe anymore. Uh, but on every other continent, we, we do find those. Any other cordyceps species has basically been found throughout the world. What other kind of insects does it infect? Insects from different orders. So you name it, it, it gets infected by, by the uh, fungal parasite and a lot of them are within those cordyceps and, and Ophiocordyceps groups. So uh, I keep on separating them because people keep on um, uh, talking about cordyceps, but... Um, uh, they've been recently, or not too recently, but uh, they've been at one point separated into different genera. So, um, and it very much specifies certain groups. So the ones, again, the ones that I work on officially, they're not called cordyceps anymore. How does it infect the ants? Part of this is a little bit of a black box uh, because certain parts of the biology um, we haven't quite discovered yet. Uh, but what we think is that uh, these fungi, they release spores, and uh, these ants obviously pick up the spores. How they pick them up, we don't know exactly. Um, that can either be because the spores have rained down on the insect and that way attached to its exoskeleton and then buried its way, its way inside. But it could also be that it first falls on the forest floor and then the ants walk over uh, the spores and pick them up that way. But eventually the, the spore makes it inside, starts growing there as a, as a yeast. And then as the cells accumulate um, in, inside the insect, what we see is that this uh, behavior of the insect slowly starts to change. So uh, through recent years, we figured out all sorts of um, uh, classifications of behavior or groups of behavior that actually change. But... The bigger final part of, of the manipulation is that eventually these ants um, leave the nest, then climb up the vegetation. This is where they latch on with their mandibles, um, kind of staying firmly in place. This is often also called the death grip because these ants don't, don't release themselves anymore. Uh, eventually this is where, where the insect dies because of the fungal infection. So this is the moment when the fungus starts to consume everything. Before that point, uh, what we see or what we, we think actually we see from the data is that the fungus is actually tiptoeing around, you know, taking just enough energy to keep growing, but keep the, uh, the insect um, fairly intact, especially its neurological tissue. Um, then after the ant has bitten down and died, uh, a fungal stalk grows out of, uh, uh, from behind the head. Uh, forms a fruiting body, and this is where the spores are formed and then disperse from again to infect me. How does the infection change their behavior? Like what are yeah, the first symptoms or what are, what are other ants seeing? So one of the things that we see in the lab is that these ants don't really participate in group activities anymore. So these ants, the ants generally that get infected are the foragers of the group. So they are the ones that leave the nest uh, to find food. Uh, normally, ants can do this fairly efficiently, where they make trails and everyone nicely follows the trail towards the food and is effective in, in that way. So there's lots of communication happening. Um, what we see in the ants that get infected is then that they're not so good at this anymore. So uh, in our uh, infection setups, what we saw was that these ants were 
not necessarily interested in finding food anymore. They were wandering around, being hyperactive. Uh, act actually, what we saw is they were active at all times of the day. While uh, normally these ants have a very nice activity pattern, so the, the species that I worked with, for instance, they're mostly active during the nighttime. Um, so we see see a very nice foraging peak during the nighttime, and for infected individuals, they are just constantly active, uh, kind of wandering around. Now, what we think that means in nature is that these ants kind of get lost in both space and time, and uh, that way kind of uh, get removed from from the colony. And um, in a way, this could be just a general hallmark of disease that this also happens in ants that get another sort of infection. But it's actually kind of helpful for this fungus as well, because what we also see in our experiments, if these ants cannot get away, they get uh, detected by nest healthy nestmates. So we think yeah. that happens with smell. So the, the smell of these ants might change, therefore they're recognized as being sick or both as being non-self, so different from, from the other nestmates. And uh, what we see is that uh, healthy nestmates actually aggressively will attack and uh, get rid of her as some sort of social immunity response. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of the behaviors that we see happening beforehand. So activity changes, uh, communication is reduced. And um, we see changes in the biological clock. So daily rhythms are changing as well. Um, I was wondering, does it ever get spread enough to cause something like colony collapse? This isn't our work, but but from, from someone else, uh, she was a grad student at Penn State. Um, what she did is actually for colonies in Brazil that would get infected, um, uh, she would actually go back there every half year or every year uh, for multiple years. And she had lots of data basically to try and figure out indeed if there would be colony collapse. And what she saw is that even though lots of colonies were infected, it actually did not really affect them in, in the sense that they, they couldn't persist. What we think is that there isn't a whole lot of pressure on, on colonies from this disease, that it, we don't think it's it's uh, wiping out entire colonies. Um, but it's more like a chronic cold happening in the background, picking off a, a bunch of foragers every once in a while, but basically leaving the, the remainder of the colony intact. What role does light play? Yeah, so this is something that very much intrigues me, the role of light. Uh, we have looked in, into that quite a bit because one of the really intriguing things that we're seeing is that these ants don't just bite and climb and bite. They do this at a certain time of day. So uh, what David Hughes found in 2011, studying ants in Thailand that, that get this, um, uh, he noticed that uh, as he followed ants around and, and kind of tried to figure out the timing of, of biting in, in the field, uh, that they were all doing this around solar mean. Now, nowadays, we can study this uh, phenomenon in the lab across different species. That's uh, This is something that we've done. And what we see is that even though um, we don't see these ants all biting around solar noon, like in, in nature, um, we see a phase shift. So these ants do climb and bite at a certain time, but at a different time of day. Uh, so there's, there's something about timing. And we think actually it's light driven because, of course, in the lab, we cannot quite mimic what happens in nature. So we think because we changed light settings or basically environmental settings, we see the shift, but we see this very nice synchronized timing. So there's something about um, uh, about this manipulation that probably involves biological blocks and the processes that are uh, entrained by light. Um, one of the other things that we've seen in a recent study, so um, before I moved to Utrecht, I was in Florida at the University of Central Florida, and um, we did a year-long field study following um, ant cadavers in the wild. And we took lots of different measurements. And one of the measurements that we took was light at the cadaver. Um, we also took their height and we figured out what the canopy cover was of the areas where we find the ants. Um, one of the things that we would find was that these ants um, would climb to a certain height and that height was correlated to the canopy cover. Um, then when we tried to correlate um, the amount of light at the cadaver to the canopy cover, we didn't see uh, that there there was a relationship, but what we noticed was that all these ants, or the vast majority actually of these ants, were all at a certain light level. 
So what we think is that these now is that these ants climb up to a certain light that gets them an, a certain amount of light, and that this is then in fact helping helping the fungus to further develop and for, for uh, uh, form its fruiting body. So light is, I think we uh, um, light is basically one of the main drivers behind this. Is uh, something that we're we're um, approach or um, trying to figure out right now. So. Uh, light-driven biological clocks are definitely involved in, in this disease in one way or another because it doesn't matter how we look at it, they, we always see something popping out of our data that is related to this. So this, we don't only see this in the field, but we also see this, for instance, in our uh, transcript mixed data, so looking at gene expression. You mentioned that they're not really in Europe anymore, and you talked about Brazil and Florida. Are there other environmental impacts like the humidity or something like that coming into play? So of course, those light levels actually come with their own microclimate, right? right? They come with a certain humidity, uh, they come with a certain temperature. So it might not be just the light by itself, um, but the temperature and humidity levels that come with this that might help the fungus better develop and then better, better spread its spores. So uh, we can't really disconnect those things very well. Um, uh, from another study that um, uh, my colleagues in Brazil have uh, have done, and I was a part of, uh, what we saw there was that if we go and and mess with the light, then uh, we see that ants don't really end up in those areas anymore where we kind of reduce the light, um, and uh, they also don't really fall for fruiting bodies anymore, or at least at a, a much lower level than in the regular situation. Now in that case. The light levels were the biggest manipulation that we could do, but also, of course, that came uh, that was paired with temperature and humidity to a certain extent. So, so you might be right. Maybe it's humidity. Maybe it's temperature. And those very small changes actually uh, um, make all the difference. Uh, but we think that yeah, light is the main main driver here to to get to those fine tuned uh, conditions. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about is the sporing process itself. Why do you think that that has been the mode that it's adapted to? Can you specify? What like, you like what about spores makes it a good reproduction method? Oh, this is basically how fungi function. Right. <laughs> and how they get themselves from one position to the next. They, uh, they can really move around, right? So the spores are the perfect vehicle to get from one place to the next. So it's not just parasitic fungi that do this, but, uh, you know, mushrooms, emerging from the forest floor that might be saprophytic or uh, have other lifestyles. Actually, we see we see this for all fungi. So uh, you can imagine spores being very light and, and being produced in mass amounts. It's actually a very effective way of, um, you know, spreading and, and making sure you, you end up somewhere to, to continue uh, growing. Are there any thing about cordyceps that are good for people? Cordyceps um, in Chinese medicine has been used for a very long time um, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, that is not my expertise, so I, I can't give you details there. Um, but it, so there's something about the molecules potentially that these fungi produce that might be beneficial to us, right? So um, the, other, the other thing is that uh, what we're studying here are parasites that interact with insects. So as we learn how they do this, we learn uh, a bit more about, again, the molecules that they produce, uh, how they interact with those insects, in this case, how they change behavior or their physiology. So all that information could actually be uh, potentially used in pest control purposes. Um, the way we're doing that now is um, um, in very specific ways. We have certain classes of pesticides that either work well or they don't work well anymore because there's resistance against those. Uh, but we we know very little um, in, in general about insect physiology. So potentially, you know, the, the, the studying the fungi that interact with them actually unlocks some of those um, um, some of those bits of knowledge that, that we could um, uh, put to work in an applied perspective. And finally, can you tell us a little bit about how National Science Foundation funding has impacted your research over the years? Through uh, the National Science Foundation, I was lucky enough to get a career award, and that actually allowed me to uh, start to move the research that I do from 
the more general field perspective and the more general hypotheses that we have might have about how this might all work, right? That's the big question that everyone has about the system. How does this work? Um, so uh, the, the, through the National Science Foundation, we've actually been able to uh, move our work from, from a more uh, broad perspective to a molecular perspective. So we're getting more and more molecular with our work and more and more into the nitty gritty details about the, me uh, the molecular mechanisms that are underlying uh, manipulated behaviors and ends and how fungi might actually establish this. So um, basically without that grant, I wouldn't have been able to to get where, where I am today, where we're, we're actually really drilling down in, into the molecules and what, what each of them are doing. What can you tell me about the biodiversity of cordyceps species? Uh, so far, only a handful of these species have been described. And um, what we know for the ones that infect ants is that each ant species that we so far have discovered and described has its own specific Ophiocordyceps species. So that means as biodiverse as, as ants are, <laughs> and uh, considering that probably quite some more species than we've discovered so far are infected, the biodiversity of this is, is enormous. So there's lots more to discover there. Thank you so much for your time today. Great. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Teresa De Becker, Matt Christensen, Dominic Della, Gino Scafidio, and Adam Eggers. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Watch an extended version of this conversation on our YouTube channel by searching at NSF Science. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you'd like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.